The next sip of coffee can wait for a few moments. And uh, let's just bow our hearts and let's just invite the Lord to move in our midst tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for the lovely spirit of worship, Lord. Thank you for your transforming presence in this room in worship tonight. And God, as we take some time tonight to look into the word of the Lord together, we ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would come and just, again, blow through this room, Lord. Let us be amazed, Lord, at your goodness in our midst. And I pray that you transform people tonight from glory to glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Well, tonight we want to talk with you about something very powerful, which is living a lifestyle of giving, a lifestyle of giving. You know, giving is about more than giving your tithes and making offerings to the Lord. It's about emulating God. It's about imitating God in his generous heart of grace. And in order to grow in the grace and kindness of the Lord, we need to do several things. First, we need to see that everything we have has been given to us as a gift of God's grace. Second, I think we need to see that we can only give back out of the same grace that we've received from God. And third, we need to learn that as we imitate the Lord's generosity towards others, what we're doing is we're unlocking the blessings of the kingdom of God for other people's lives, and we get to experience his joy as we do that at the same time. There's several key areas in which God calls us to give the way that he gives. And first, I think, is the granting of forgiveness. That's a little outside of the scope of what we can talk about tonight. We don't really have time to teach about forgiveness tonight, but I want to encourage you, in the fall, you will greatly benefit, if you've not taken Cleansing Stream, you will greatly benefit from taking the Cleansing Stream course. And in Cleansing Stream, we teach on forgiveness quite extensively, and we help people to get free from the prison of unforgiveness, because I believe that unforgiveness is really a prison that has a lot of people bound. Amen? Amen. Second area in which God calls us to give is the giving of our material resources. And the third area in which God calls us to give the way he gives is in the giving of our time and our effort in the serving of other people. So in order to live as agents of the kingdom, in order to become a people who spread his kingdom, we have to model God's grace, which is his kindness and his generosity towards us. It's especially seen in how God treats people who are undeserving of it. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That's awesome. So with this in mind tonight, we're going to share quickly about a lifestyle of giving. I'll be talking for a few minutes. Remember, at the beginning of the course, I explained God in half an hour. So tonight, I'm going to explain about the giving of our material resources in 14 minutes. And then our friend Brian Robbins is going to come, and he's going to share about giving of ourselves and service to others. So let's talk about a lifestyle of giving tonight, and let's begin by looking at the believer and money. And the first thing the Bible teaches us of importance here is that we are managers of God's money. We're managers of God's money. Proverbs chapter 3 tells us to honor the Lord with your riches and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your, shall your barns be filled with plenty and your presses, that means your wine presses, burst out with new wine. Why talk about money in a course like this. It's because how I use money reveals my heart. Jesus said, where your treasure is, right, there will your heart be also. And if God has really touched our hearts, then we will want to, as believers, seek out what God has to say concerning money and will seek to live that out in our lives. You see, if Jesus is Lord, if Jesus is Lord of everything, then that means he has to be Lord of our finances as well. Amen. God wants us, I believe, to use his money principles to overcome our difficulties and receive blessing. And so finances is really just one more area in life where Christ gives people victory and freedom. A few things to note here. First, God cares about our use of money and our attitude towards it. It's amazing to think that the Bible has more than 2,000 verses that relate in some way to the subject of money. Jesus, out of the almost 40 parables that he told, 16 of them were about money. So 
I, I think it should be obvious to us that God wants to teach us how to walk in his ways concerning money, how to walk in prosperity, and how to walk in generosity. God's a giver, and he wants us to imitate him in that. He wants us to give out of a heart like his heart. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each one, as he purposes in his heart, let him give, not out of grief or compulsion of necessity, because God loves a cheerful giver. God wants us to change our concept of money. Some of us need to change our thinking about money and move in our thinking from the idea of ownership to the idea of stewardship. Stewardship means, if you're a steward, it means that what you are, are operating in, what you're working with, is not your own money, but you are a manager of somebody else's money. Stewardship, as a concept, helps us to realize that all that we have has come from God. Paul asks us a very powerful question in 1 Corinthians 4. He says, what do you have that you did not receive? What do you have that you did not receive? I like when, you know, sometimes when Pastor Glenn uh, takes an offering, he'll say something like, you might have worked hard, but it's God that enabled you to work hard in the first place. Everything that we have comes to us through the grace and the kindness of God. Another important question about money, whom are we serving? See, Jesus said that we cannot serve both God and mammon. Mammon was the god of money. It was referred to as the god of riches in the Middle East. We can use and we can enjoy money, but we are not to serve it. Money is a great tool, a great servant, but a lousy master. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one, cling to it, he said, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And you know, God desires, he says in his word, he desires to bless us financially. How many of you know that wonderful little verse in 3 John, 3 John verse 2, where it says that God desires us above all things to prosper and be in health how? According to how our soul is prospering. So I believe that God desires his people to prosper, but there's a, an interesting paradox about human life is that sometimes the very blessings that we receive from God can cause our, our hearts to be seduced away from God. And so the very blessing that he showers on us in his goodness if we're not careful, can be the cause of our hearts actually wandering away from the Lord. And Moses warned the people about this paradox. In Deuteronomy 6, he says, It shall be when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you great and good cities which you did not build, and houses full of every good thing which you did not fill, and wells which are dug but which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant and you shall eat and be full you shall be on guard lest you forget the Lord who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of slaves so a very interesting warning and I think this is a dynamic that we experience in our own country today Look at the wealth of our nation. It's a tremendous blessing from God. I think you would agree that America grew to become probably the wealthiest nation that's ever existed in the history of the world up to this point. And yet, I think we could safely say, looking at it through spiritual eyes, that the great wealth of America has actually caused people to do what Moses warned about. So materialism is a danger. It can pull us away in our hearts from God. Moses said, be careful that it doesn't cause you to forget the Lord. Well, is it better to be rich or poor? You know what, what Mae West said, right? I've been rich and I've been poor. Somebody said that anyway. And rich is better. But, you know, biblically speaking, wealth is not always a sign of God's favor. Wealth is not always a sign of God's favor. Neither is poverty necessarily a sign of God's disfavor. Money can be good or evil depending on how it's used. There were some rich people in the scripture who were very righteous and lauded by God. There were also some poor people in the scripture who were lauded by God. And scripture says that God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in, in faith. But God warns against, what he warns us against is the love of money, which he says is a root of all kinds of evil. And what's the antidote for us 
to the love of money, which is something which uh, this part of the world is, is really tempted with to such a high degree. The antidote against that love of money is giving. It's to be generous in your spirit. I believe the Bible teaches that when we give sacrificially, God will meet our needs. I, I heard one mm-hmm, but no amens. <laughs> So at least some, some person over here, not sure who, has experienced God's blessing in response to sacrificial giving. And pastor, that's a good start right there. God doesn't measure the way that we do. Remember the widow's mite. She dropped in those two little lepta. They were two little coins that were worth about a quarter of a cent. She gave less than anybody, but God saw her as having given more than anybody else had given. The hole that she gave through was a big hole. And you know, the hole that we give through is the hole that we'll receive through. She gave more than anybody in God's estimation. See, I, could, I think that this can work for us or against us. Jesus said, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you measure with, it shall be measured to you again, Luke 6, 38. It's interesting. Jesus said they will pour into your bosom. They used to wear garments, the men did, that didn't have rounded skirts, but skirts with corners. And if you uh, lifted up the front corners of your skirt and held it up, you had an instant container with you. So nobody ever had to ask you, you know, paper or plastic. You could just, you could just go like this, and Jesus said they would fill your bosom with that and so you would be laden down with what would be poured into your lap that's what that verse means and that's a good overflowing blessing but Jesus said that it's with the measure that you measure out that is the measure through which you will receive again and that's a powerful word God's standard or his beginning point in giving for us is the tithe tithing is giving the first 10 percent of your income to the Lord, to God's work, and it's a plan that God has devised in order to provide for the work of the kingdom and to bless those who give. Tithing calls for faith in our part, so it reminds us that God owns everything and that we are only stewards of the things that he's given to us. God encourages us to give this way in accordance with how often, with how frequently we ourselves are paid. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, upon the first day of the week, let, by the way, that's, that's a little verse for, for you who, who believe that people should not worship on Sunday. I know a couple of you are out there. But Paul said, on the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store according to how God has prospered him so that there will be no gatherings when I come. Probably the most well-known passage in the scripture connected with the tithe is found in Malachi chapter 3, where God speaks to his people about tithing, and specifically he was speaking to them about the fact that they really hadn't been doing it that much. And uh, God said to the Israelites there in Malachi 3, Will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me? But you say, In what have we robbed you? In the tithe and the offering. You're cursed with a curse, for you're robbing me, the nation, all of it. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now with this, says the Lord of hosts, to see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out a blessing for you until there is not enough room. In other words, room to contain it. And I will rebuke your devourer, and he shall not decay the fruit of your ground against you, nor shall your vine miscarry against you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Ten quick things we can see here, and you can fill in the blanks as we go. First, God said to withhold tithes was viewed as robbery by God. It was viewed as robbery by God. Second thing is that this can bring into our lives, this can bring a curse. And in the case of Malachi's audience, God was saying that the failure to give had apparently brought a curse upon them. Third, the storehouses. What were the storehouses? The storehouses were places where tithes were brought in order to support the work of the ministry. So these were storerooms that were connected, that were part of the temple area. And this shows us that we should tithe in order to provide food in God's house. Number four I like because this says something about God encouraging faith in us. 
this passage, this is the only place where God says to put him to the test. This is the only place in scripture where God says, I dare you. Put me to the test. Number five, God will open the windows of heaven and pour blessing into you until there are no more vessels or storehouses to contain it. You saw this in the story of Elisha and the widow. It only stopped flowing when, we, when she ran out of containers to pour it into. Number six, I like to, God will rebuke the devourer of your labor and forbid the enemy to deprive you of the material blessings that God intends for you. Cut it out, devil. Number seven, God says here that this will end the cycle of miscarriage in your life. If you've ever experienced a cycle or a pattern in your life where it would seem that you're taking two steps forward and then three steps backward, that kind of thing, you will see a full harvest. So God wants to end the cycle of miscarriage and lack of fruitfulness in your life. Number eight, he promises the people your land will become delightful. In other words, people will notice, people around you will notice that your life has the blessing of God resting on it. Number nine, that they'll call you blessed when they see it. Others will notice this and call you blessed. And number 10, although the enemy once fought against you, now the Lord says he will fight for you. He will fight for you. And that's revealed in his use of his special name, Yahweh of hosts, which means the Lord of armies. So that's a powerful statement that God is going to fight for us with his armies. There are also offerings that we do over and above the tithe. We're called to give offerings over and above the tithe. Offerings include almsgiving, which is the practice of making gifts to support the poor. And church, I want you to know, it doesn't matter what any propaganda says of, of any people nowadays who are atheistic or who uh, attack Christian work. Christians have always been in society at the forefront of charitable works. The development of modern hospitals, of orphanages, and other social reforms, things like the hospital that we take for granted in many societies, that was an invention of the Christian church. And the development of all these things, which now come under the heading of social justice, uh, owes a, a great deal to Bible-believing Christians. A converted heart, if your heart is truly converted, you will have concern for the poor. Now, the fallenness of this world means that people, uh, because of the fall, because of the condition of this world, people are always passing in and out of poverty. And people experience what the world calls reversals of fortune. So it's wrong for us to say that poverty is always caused in a person's life by sin or by sinful uh, habits and things like that. And you know, in the Old Testament, God provided for the poor in a number of ways. God tells us in so many places in scripture that he will defend the poor and he warns judges not to twist, not to pervert judgment because a poor person is involved and can't defend himself or fight back. The New Testament obviously values charity extremely highly and Jesus didn't command us to do this. He assumed that we would do this. Jesus assumed that we would practice alms giving. He said in Matthew 6, when you do alms, he didn't say if, he said when you do alms, let not your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be in secret and your father who sees in secret himself shall reward you openly. And throughout the New Testament, the church demonstrated God's care for the poor. What does God say about our treatment of the poor and needy? Well, first, God says he is setting himself against people who injure the poor or who shut their ears and their hearts toward them. God says in Proverbs 21, 13, whoever stops his ear at the cry of the poor, he shall also cry out himself and not be heard. Second, God blesses those who bless the poor. He says, he that has pity upon the poor actually is lending to the Lord. How about that? And that which he has given, he will pay him again. Third, God says he will preserve people who help the poor. Wonderful promise in Psalm 41. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and you will not deliver him over to the will of his enemies. If you keep reading in that psalm, it talks about how God will even heal such a person physically. Wonderful promise. 
how do we manage what God has given? There are uh, so many different uh, things we could pull out, but I'm going to give you seven real quick. Now, um, this is a fresh, this is why we call this fresh look, because we can only take a quick look at these things. I want to uh, encourage you to continue to look into these things in your own studies, but really quickly, there's seven, I think, major um, disciplines that we can see as to how to manage what God has given us. First is diligence in work. The Bible says a very unpopular thing in, in 2 Thessalonians 3, which is if you don't work, you don't eat. So that's not very popular uh, nowadays in some circles. But uh, Proverbs 22 says, do you see a man diligent in his business? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before common or unknown men. Second is diligent management. Proverbs 27, 23 says, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and look well to your herds. Be diligent in managing what's in your hand. Third is faithful giving. Such a powerful principle, faithful giving. Fourth is being submitted to biblical teaching. God's ideas about how these things should operate need to take precedence and override my ideas of what giving is about. And we need to be submitted to what God's word says in the matter. Number five is continuing education. We should seek all our lives, because money is an important part of life, we should seek to become increasingly more educated in financial matters. Number six, get wise counsel. Get wise counsel. If you don't know what to do, if you can't find a way out of trouble, find someone who has the education, who has the experience, or is just doing better and get advice and counsel from them. And seven, grow in contentment, because these are matters of the heart. Paul said, I'm not speaking according to need because I've learned to be content in whatever state I am. He said, uh, I've been taught both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. I can do or I can, uh, I can endure all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4. So we should always, in whatever state we find ourselves in, if we're doing well or doing not so well financially, we should seek for that grace of contentment in our hearts. Jesus says to give with eternity in mind. We need to be investing with our eye on eternity. Jesus said in Matthew 6, don't lay up treasures on earth for yourselves where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up treasures in heaven for yourselves where neither moth nor rust corrupt and where thieves do not break in nor steal. One way that we can sow into eternity is by giving to missions. There may not ever be an earthly return on an investment like that, but there is certainly going to be a heavenly one. There's also investing for the here and now, which we should do if we can, which is very godly. What about saving? Is it wrong to save? Well, I don't believe it's, it's wrong to save simply because Jesus phrased things that way. You know, John Wesley's advice was to make all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. The scripture says in Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his son's sons, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. So... Um, before Brian comes, I'll leave you with this. How should we give money or anything else? What is the biblical way to give? First, give in faith as a seed. Give in faith, trusting God for the return like a seed. Ecclesiastes 11 one says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you shall find it after many days. Consider that as you give, as you give your tithe, as you give offerings, as you give to people who need help, that that is seed that's going to grow into a good harvest. Second, give generously. Proverbs 11.24 says, there is a man who scatters and yet increases, but there is one who withholds what is justly due and it only comes to poverty. The soul who gives freely shall be made fat and he who waters shall also be watered himself. So be generous. Third, give without expectation of earthly repayment. Without expectation of earthly repayment. If you could have your reward from a man or have your reward from God, who would you want to be the one to determine your reward? I would rather have God determine my reward. Jesus said, love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest, because he is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Luke 6.35. And then, uh, as we read before in 2 Corinthians 9.7, uh, we need to give joyously. Paul said, each one, as he purposes in his heart, let him give, not out of grief or out of necessity, because God loves a cheerful 
giver. Give with the joy of the Lord that you're flowing in God's joy when you give to someone else and when you give to the Lord's work. My prayer is that we will all experience an increase in God's favor and blessing in our lives as we flow more and more in the generosity uh, of the Lord. And 10 second commercial, make sure you really do sign up and let us know that you're coming to The Blessed Life because it's a great exploration of these concepts in much greater detail than I can give you tonight and how it applies to all the rest of life as well. So at this point, Brian's gonna come and Brian's gonna share with us about how we give to the Lord and how we give to others through the grace of serving others. So let's welcome Brian as he comes to share with us about serving others. Thanks, Pastor Nick. Hi, friends. So, lifestyle of giving, and I'm going to talk about service to others. Um, if you don't mind, I want to start with what is probably the most powerful verse in Scripture that relates to the concept of service. Um, it might very well be one of the more profound, if not disturbing, verses in all of Scripture, I think. If you have a highlight pen, and you don't mind marking up your Bibles, this is a keeper. And I would almost apologize because it's a little long, but I'll never apologize for reading Scripture. So bear with me. It's in your notes, and I'll read it, and you can follow along. It's Matthew 25, 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you. The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or need clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly, I tell you. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. I think you really need to pause and think about that because you say, wow, wait a second, hold on. That sounds like a work-based gospel. That looks like we have to do all these good things and we'll be saved. And I'll say no. If you did even all these wonderful things and that's all you did, you will not find your way to the kingdom of heaven because you go through faith in Jesus Christ. But by the same token, if you purport to have faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and do not do these things, you have dead faith. As James says in 2.17, James 2.17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith, true saving faith, leads to works. It's evidence of our faith. You can't have one without the other. So this message of the importance of service, I'm going to talk about what that is, is an extraordinarily powerful message in Scripture. It's one of the, Jesus himself is known as the suffering servant. He's a servant, and so should we be. 
Jesus came to serve. Matthew 20, 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. You read Isaiah 53, it's all about the suffering service. Jesus worked for our salvation. He worked for us in service, and we're supposed to emulate Jesus in our lives, to become more Christ-like. That is our mission. That is our goal. Scripture further tells us in Philippians 2, 5 to 8, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So important is it for us to model our lives after Christ, a book which perhaps next to the Bible may be the best-selling book of theology ever written. I'll have to Google that. I didn't do that in advance, but it may well be. It's called The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Kempis. I mean, the title is The Imitation of Christ. It is a book devoted to how to live a Christ-like life and to model our lives after him. And one of the principal things that Jesus taught us to do was to serve others, hearkening back again to that critical verse we started with in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Be like Christ. In Luke 9, 23, it tells us, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple, this is Jesus, my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me, follow Jesus. Jesus suffered for us the daily sufferings, and some of those sufferings were giving of himself for others, the first to take care of others and put others ahead of himself. And that's what we're supposed to do as Christians. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Follow me means believe in me and be like me and follow my teaching. Jesus said, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. The greatest evidence that we are in Christ is if we are living like Christ. Jesus taught us to serve. In Matthew 20, 25 to 27, it says that Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. He's talking to his disciples. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. So again, so central was this focus of service to others in Jesus' ministry that he's actually telling his disciples that to be great, you have to be small. To be first in the kingdom, you have to be the first to offer your service to others and put them ahead of you. John 13, 12 to 17. Check this out. When he had finished washing their feet, our Lord Jesus Christ washing the feet of the apostles. When he had finished washing their feet, he, Jesus, put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He want to make sure they really got it. He asked them, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you in an example that you should do as I have done for you. For truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is the messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. But if you didn't get it from the words of Jesus himself, Jesus' apostles, appointed divinely apostles, appointed apostles also taught us to serve others. In Galatians 5.13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do, new, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly and in love. Similarly, in 1 Peter 4.9-10, we're taught again by the apostles, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Just as Pastor Nick was just telling us, everything we have, we got by grace from God. So we're supposed to use that for the benefit of our brethren. Well, how can we serve? Okay, we got the message. Jesus told us that we should have a life of service. The apostles told us we should have a life of service. How do we do that? Well, lots of ways. Perhaps, it's hard to say what the most important is, but perhaps the most important 
because of what it means in terms of salvation, is we can serve others by sharing the gospel, evangelism. St. Francis Assisi is attributed to have said, preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. And lest there be any doubt, Jesus commanded his disciples to preach the gospel to all the nations. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, Mark 6.15. Well, what are ways we can do this? One way is to invite a non-believer to this church. I'm going to tell you something. I invited somebody very close to me to this church earlier this year. Pastor Glenn preached about Barnabas, and she accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior right here. Amen. That's, uh, that's a great service that we can do for, for a non-believer. We can teach believers. We can teach believers in Sunday school, and there are many people here who, who teach diligently in these schools here, you know, adults and children. We can teach and participate in teaching in Bible study and encourage each other to share the word and to get a, a better understanding of God's word and his will. Um, we know that the apostles consistently shared the good news and never stopped teaching or proclaiming the gospel. It said in Acts 5.42, that day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped, never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And that's, again, one of the great ways we can serve others. Another way we can serve others is to pray. We had, did a whole talk on prayer several weeks ago as part of Fresh Look. We can pray for other people. What a great service. You can do that right now. You can close your eyes and think about somebody for whom they have a need. It could be a physical need. It could be a mental need. It could be a material need. It could be a spiritual need. Amen. And we can pray for them right now. And that's a tremendous service for others. In James 5, 16, it tells us, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That's God's word, so I believe it. We can pray for each other. What a great way to serve there. We can, of course, care for the sick and the poor. We can go to the hospital and visit those who are sick. We can work for charities and care for widows and orphans. In Deuteronomy 24 19, it said, When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow so that your Lord, your God, may bless you in all the work of your hands. Well, if you came to hear Pastor Glenn's sermon, I think it was just last week, and he talked about Ruth and Boaz, what did Boaz do? He did exactly this. He saw this poor widow in the field. He followed God's word. He left some extra grain for her. She became his wife. And Jesus Christ is descended through Boaz and Ruth. Now, think about that. Talk about a blessing for serving others. Following God's word and following God's plan in our lives leads to tremendous blessings, even if we don't see them immediately. You can volunteer at a shelter. You can and should and must, this is my personal petition here, taking some poetic license to something that's very important in my life, stand up for those who can't help themselves and protect the unborn. A abortion is the biggest moral failure of our country. And we all share in some collective culpability for that when we don't do everything we possibly can to stand up to protect the unborn. Love your spouse. Marriage is not 50-50. You, know, you always hear marriage, it sounds pretty good. It's 100-100. So we're supposed to put our spouses first in our lives and get everything back. Again, scripture tells us, so I'm not making it up, it says in Ephesians 5.28, in this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. We can serve each other by demonstrating love for an interest for others, whether they be families, whether they be friends, or whether they be strangers. In fact, I'd say love for a stranger is harder and that much more, I think, effective in terms of what we're doing in terms of sharing the gospel and proving ourselves to be Christians. It's easy to love somebody who's part of your family and who kind of cares for you. It's really hard to love somebody who spits in your face. But that's what we're supposed to do. In fact, when Jesus summarized the commandments, when asked by somebody, what's the most important commandments? He said, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery. That's a good one. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. 
And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one. Love your neighbor as yourself. So I'm going to tell you a little story, a parable, if I might, or for my Jewish brethren, because I'm a Jewish believer, a Midrash, that may get a little to this point. There was a man and a woman. They were married 30 years, tremendously in love. Wife was a devout Christian. Father, husband was what I'll call a lowercase c Christian, never quite got it, but dutifully went to church all those years. They had three glorious children. It was Christmas Eve. They were getting ready to go to church, and the husband turned to his wife and he said, Honey, you know what? All these years, I never quite got it. I don't understand why Jesus is God and why Jesus would come in the form of a man. I can't be a hypocrite any longer. You go on Christmas Eve to church with the kids without me. Well, wife was heartbroken, and, but she understood she loved her husband. She said she and the kids would pray for him, and the wife and children left, and the husband was home by himself, reflecting on the fact that He never really understood this, and it just was the way it is. Well, that night was a tremendous storm outside. It was snowing and sleeting and howling and raining all at the same time. And he heard a tremendous ruckus outside. He opened up his front door, and he saw a flock of Canadian geese. And these poor geese were clearly in an extremist situation. They they were stuck in the cold and in the storm, and they had no shelter. So this man, you know, was a sensitive gentleman, and so he... He, he tried everything he could do to try to get the geese to come in. He couldn't do it, and he had a big barn. So he put on all of his rain gear and his winter gear, and he went out, and he opened up the barn doors and said, Come on, geese, come on in. And they wouldn't come. He ran back into the house, fighting off the elements, and got his duck call because he was a hunter, and he used the duck collar for the geese. They wouldn't come in. He went in the barn and made a fire to make it nice and warm and toasty, and the geese wouldn't come in. After doing this for a couple of hours, he was actually sweating in the middle of a snowstorm. Out of frustration, he says, gee whiz, if only I could become a goose. And then he fell down and he worshiped Jesus. And he realized that Jesus came in the form of a man so that we could relate to him and we could understand more fully who God was and we could imitate him. So be a goose, okay? Jesus was a servant. Jesus took care of others. Jesus lived a life putting his apostles, his disciples, and even the people who didn't believe him, even the Pharisees, ahead of himself. And Jesus prayed for us all and told us to pray for others. And that's what we should be doing ourselves. Isaiah 53, the most powerful verse in Scripture as it relates to Jesus as Messiah, is all about the suffering servant. Let's be servants. So our final thoughts... Matthew 20, 26, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. And finally, whoever wants to to be first must be your slave. Let's go out, preach the gospel, take care of the sick and the poor, and be a goose. Time for our small groups.